Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Takata from uh, Samo Physical Property Division. So, uh, we'd like to start the second uh, talk uh, by Professor Jong Kim from uh, the University of Maryland. Uh, I, let me introduce him uh, briefly. He graduated from uh, University of Berkeley in 1982, and after that, he has a uh, he worked for as an en mechanical engineer in uh, several companies. <laughs> then, uh, in 1990, he got a PhD uh, from the University of Minnesota. Uh, in 1992, uh, he became an assistant professor at the University of Denver, and he moved to the uh, University of Maryland uh, since uh, to uh, in 1998. Uh, since 19, uh, two, 2008, so he uh, became a full, uh, professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering, University of Maryland. Uh, he is now uh, 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 staying with a uh, KAIST during his sabbatical leave. So this uh, is a very good chance to invite uh, to QC University. And. Uh, his uh, field is the uh, heat transfer. He's uh, uh, definitely the one of the key person in the world heat transfer community, especially in the uh, area of boiling heat transfer. Uh, the uh, title of uh, today's talk is uh, the flow boiling heat transfer mechanism using uh, infrared thermography. So please start. Thank you for the uh, very exaggerated introduction. Um, Let's see, given the diverse nature of the audience, I thought I would keep this talk uh, quite uh, broad and this as an introductory level. Um, I would like to talk about uh, some research that we've been doing under NASA support. Um, it's called infrared-based uh, flow boiling heat transfer measurements. So this is completely different from catalysts. Um, this work was done by um, people in my group. Taewon Kim was a postdoc from KAIST. He spent one, one year in my lab. The other people are PhD students, and Sergey Desiatun is a uh, is a research professor, and John McQuillan is my uh, grant monitor. We've been working together for the last about 17 years. So we had a, a pool boiling experiment um, on the International Space Station that uh, that finished uh, last year, and we've been working on flow boiling for the last uh, three years or so. So I would like to discuss this technique that we have developed, and as well as some preliminary measurements. Uh, based on this. So first of all, why is NASA interested in boiling heat transfer? Okay, well, it turns out that boiling is central to many technologies that NASA is interested in. For example, if you wanted to uh, send an astronaut from the Earth to Mars, okay, it's going to take six months to go there and six months to come back. And if you wanted to provide enough water for the astronauts to survive on during this going and return period, and then if the astronaut would just drink it and throw it overboard, you could never provide enough water up there. Okay? So all the water has to be recycled. One candidate is distillation processes, for example. Another one is um, heat exchangers. All the heat exchange on the International Space Station is done by single phase flow. So you have cold water and hot water, and it's remaining liquid. If you can make boiling heat exchangers, two-phase heat exchangers, the heat transfer is much higher within these heat exchangers, so you can make them much smaller and more compact. And it costs now about $10,000 per kilogram to send something up into low Earth orbit. So every kilogram you save, you're going to save money. You can also provide more space to the astronauts, etc. So that's the motivation for studying boiling heat transfer. Uh, one of the motivations for saying boiling heat transfer in low gravity environments. Um, so uh, NASA published this uh, critical path roadmap, and they said that they came up with a bunch of risks to um, their success. And one of them said that the inability to acquire, transport, and reject waste heat from life, su life support systems is very crucial for their capabilities. It was rated red for proposed missions to Mars and yellow for proposed missions to the moon. So um, 
why do you use boiling to transfer heat? Well, it turns out that phase change processes can require an enormous amount of heat to occur. Liquids, when they're close together, you have the Van der Waals forces holding them together. If you want to convert to that to a vapor, you have to input a lot of energy to overcome these Van der Waals forces and to remove these um, you know, water molecules, for example, to a much farther distance from each other. So it requires a large amount of energy, and it also occurs at a constant temperature. So you can absorb this energy at m much lower temperatures than you would um, normally have if you had to do it by sensible heating. So just as an example, if you had one kilogram of water at room temperature, and you wanted to convert it to steam, you first have to heat it from 25 to 100 degrees Celsius, and that requires mc to p delta T, or 0 0.31 megajoules of energy. If you now want to convert that liquid at 100 degrees Celsius to steam, it requires 2.26 megajoules. So this, of this process here, 88% of it goes into phase change processes, and only 12% is, is sensible heating. Um, this is a boiling curve. Okay, so what this is is a plot of the wall heat flux versus the wall superheat. So this is the wall temperature minus the saturation temperature. This is the temperature the liquid boils at. So at relatively low wall superheats, let's say your water, let's say 101 degrees Celsius in one atmosphere, you have heat transferred by what's called natural convection. Okay, so this is a single phase. It's not, nothing's boiling. The superheated water and it's being removed. Once you get into the nucleate boiling region, however, you start to get boiling occurring, and you get a relatively strong increase in your wall heat transfer with a small increase in your wall temperature. So this is a region that's very good to be in because you can provide enormous amounts of energy at low temperatures. If your independent variable is your wall heat flux, like you have in an electronic component, a computer chip, or a nuclear reactor, though, if you increase your heat flux slightly beyond this point, okay, at this critical heat flux, you're generating vapor very, very quickly. And for some reason, which we don't understand completely why, the supply of liquid to the surface starts to decrease. Okay? And, and if you increase the heat flux slightly beyond this point, you jump out into this film boiling region where you're covering the heater with vapor and that's a very poor heat transfer mechanism. So if you had a nuclear reactor, for example, you would burn out or you would melt the core because the temperature would rise to very high levels. If you had a, um, a computer chip, it would burn out. Okay? So it's very important to know how the various processes or various factors affect this critical heat flux point. So just as a little tutorial, these are some videos that were taken by a colleague of mine, Professor Sung Moon Yu, at um, the uh, University of Texas at Arlington. And this is a platinum wire, or this is a nichrome wire, I'm sorry, and immersed in a fluid called FC72. And what he, they're doing, he's passing an electric current through this wire and is removing energy from that by this boiling process. So this is a low nucleate boiling region where you have these individual bubbles growing and leaving the surface and removing energy, okay? This is high nucleate boiling. So in this case here, you have more bubbles being formed, and a lot of these bubbles, they merge laterally, they can merge vertically, okay? But you still get a lot of heat transfer. In this image here, we, we are going into the critical heat flux process, um, through the critical heat flux process to the film boiling regime. So here, what's happening is we, we have nuclear boiling in this region here. In this region here, we're starting to get film boiling. So this wire here in this portion is completely covered by a vapor film continually. It's still generating power internally. So the temperature here is rising. It's heating up the wire next to it. And so as time goes on, the wire gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And we transition into the film boiling regime in this case here. So now I would say about here is all film boiling and here is nucleate boiling and pretty soon we're going to get the entire wire covered by a continual vapor film. So the wire temperature is increasing dramatically. 
this is an example of film boiling here. And you can see that we have this wire which is at a much higher temperature and it's expanded. That's why it's bowed. And we have these great blobs of vapor just, you know, coming off, the vapor being generated. The primary heat transfer mechanism here is not phase change. It's radiation and conduction through the vapor film. Okay. And this is an example of burnout. So at this condition here, this wire here is glowing white hot because it's at a very high temperature. And in fact, we're going to get melting of this nichrome wire in a little bit. Um, you'll see right around here, the wire is going to melt. Okay, so it's obvious that it's like 1,800 degrees Kelvin. And you see a break in the wire now. Once the break in the wire occurs, you have no more current flowing. And as a result, you go back down the, the boiling curve. The wire gets cooled, and you traverse the boiling curve again. And you're going to go down the boiling curve in this case. So this just illustrates the different mechanisms um, for, for pool boiling. What we are interested in doing is looking at the mechanisms by which heat is transferred during flow boiling. So in this case, the bulk fluid is moving. Okay. And there are many models that have been proposed over the years regarding the, um, the heat transfer. So this is a superposition model of Chen. This is another sort of superposition model that's similar to that. This is a flow regime-based model of John Tomei in Switzerland. And he's proposed a structure where you have a liquid slug an elongated bubble, a dry zone, and he can predict the heat transfer here. He can predict the heat transfer here and here, and then, you know, this thing re-wets. But, so he can get the overall heat transfer, but no one's been able to make local measurements of the heat transfer to verify these sub-models. Okay, so that's really desired. We would like to measure local heat transfer so that we can, we can, we can verify this. But all the models are uh, proposed by, uh, by Moodle as well. This is um, an example of heat transfer in 1G, in Earth gravity, and this is in low gravity produced by an environment in an aircraft. And what we're interested in from NASA's point of view is okay, if you have flow boiling, beyond a certain velocity, if the velocity is high enough, it doesn't matter if the tube is oriented vertically or horizontally or, or, or sideways, and it doesn't matter about the gravity level. Okay. So what we're interested in finding out is this velocity, in this case about 1.5, beyond which the heat transfer is not affected by the gravity level. Or if you're at a velocity lower than that, what is the degradation in the heat transfer? So we want to be able to predict what the heat transfer is and how that's altered in by different, at different gravity levels in this case. So that's the overall objective. So if we look at the heat transfer produced by boiling, it's a function of many variables, the diameter of the tube, the velocity of the vapor, and the velocity of the liquid, the gravity level, the quality, the wall superheat, the amount of uh, wall subcooling or the bulk subcooling that occurs, a bunch of fluid properties. If we use the uh, dimensional analysis, we can come up with about 10 or 11 different non-dimensional groups, which makes it very difficult to characterize because it's sensitive to all of these. Okay. Um, if we confine ourselves to a given fluid, however, these property ratios are remain constant. They, they sort of drop out. And it becomes a little bit more manageable. So instead of 11 uh, properties, we, uh, dimensional groups, we only have about seven or eight. And these are a function of these variables here. It makes the problem a little bit more manageable, but it's still a very, very complex problem. This is a review of some flow boiling work that's been done to date, mainly in microgravity area. So this is a Professor Ota's um, experiment at Kyushu University. He has a JAXA experiment. And this is supposed to be on the International Space Station in a few years. But he has uh, two test apparatus. One is a metal heated tube. So the fluid comes in here. You have this metal tube as a heater wrapped around it. And the fluid comes out. And he's able to measure the overall heat transfer and overall um, the heat transfer coefficient uh, within this tube. But he cannot measure local heat transfer with this tube. In this case, and you cannot see the fluid here. He has another test section, a transparent heated tube, where you have a glass tube and a gold film coating on the inside that serves as a heater. 
so he can look through this gold, thin gold film and look at the fluid. And he can also get the heat transfer average over this length. And, but he can, uh, so these three lengths, he can get the average heat transfer, but he cannot, again, get the local heat transfer. All right. This is um, some people in Italy. They have a quartz tube with a heater wrapped around it. So you can see through it. You can see the flow of visualization. You can look at the uh, bubbles. But the boundary condition here is not so good. It's not very well defined. So if you want to do some numerical simulations, you, you, you couldn't. And also, the, um, you can only get an average heat transfer in this case. Professor Mudawar, this is um, Zhang and Mudawar at Purdue University, he again has this, uh, this, this copper block with some heat, heaters resistively soldered onto it. And again, he can only get time averaged, area averaged heat transfer measurements. No local measurements at all. <clears throat> These are some, this is some um, work uh, that's been done by uh, people in France. I won't go through that. So if we had a, if you wanted to design an experiment that we could measure all these quantities, what kind of characteristics would we want? Well, first of all, we want a realistic geometry. And so we decide on a circular tube. It's the simplest geometry. And we have some analytical predictions for that. So we want to, and it's really used in heat exchangers. So we want a realistic geometry. We want to be able to make some local heat transfer measurements. We also want to provide some flow visualization. We want to see what's has, you know, what flow regime, whether an annular flow or a bubbly flow or a slug flow or whatever. We want to be able to see all that. We're going to be flying on an aircraft to produce low gravity environments. So we can't wait two hours for the heater to come to equilibrium when we only have about 20 to 25 seconds of microgravity time. So we have to have a fast heater response. We want a very well-known boundary condition. We don't want a heater you know, with a teething tape wrapped around it. And we also we need to go to uh, pretty much high heat flux capability. So we need a tube um, that is transparent but can be electrically heated. So we have a nice uniform boundary condition. And we need a method to measure local heat fluxes. So what kind of material do we need in order to be able to satisfy all these conditions that we've set for ourselves in our ideal test section? What we need is transparent aluminum. Okay, That's the material. If we had transparent aluminum, we could see through it. We could look at the visual light the bubbles and stuff. We could electrically heat the wall. We can hopefully measure the temperature somehow, and we can come up with the local heat transfer coefficients. I'm glad to report that we have found an elect and a transparent aluminum. I bet you didn't even know about this either. Right? I have it right in my pocket here. So this is a trans sort of a transparent aluminum. Okay, so this is a tube. I'll pass it around. Can you can take a look at it? Um, it's a little brittle, but uh, if you look at it, it's not transparent. Okay, but it is transparent if you look at it in the infrared regime. Because this is a tube that is made out of silicon. Okay, so the silicon tube here is doped. So we can apply a voltage across it. We can electrically heat the silicon tube. And silicon is transparent to the infrared. So we can use an IR camera, and we can look right through the wall, and we can look at the fluid. All right, so that's the idea. So we have this uh, silicon tube here, and we have these electrodes to measure, to supply power, and we also measure the voltage across it. And we put the silicon tube into this test um, chamber here, and, um, and, 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 we, and we measure the heat transfer locally within the silicon tube, so using infrared. So infrared measurements in boiling is not new. I'm not the first one to do this. As uh, Professor Zhang would say, he, he's been using IR many years ago, um, and we're, we're just starting it. So uh, we're sort of late to the party, but you know, it's a new application. So this is an example of a stainless steel plate where you have boiling on top. It's a very thin stainless steel plate, and you're using an infrared camera to look at the heat transfer distribution produced by the boiling bubbles on the wall. This is done by Peter Stefan at uh, Darmstadt University. Um, these are some measurements that were done um, by Kenning, again, he has this uh, very thin stainless steel foil, which he electrically heats, and he's looking at boiling. And this is the 
the temperature distribution produced by these boiling bubbles. Uh, this is another uh, pool boiling study produced by uh, Bongiorno's group at MIT. And they had this ITO on a sapphire substrate. And they had this dichroic mirror. And so they were able to make uh, high-speed infrared measurements along with the uh, visualization of the flow. So this is the uh, visual image of the bubble growing and leaving the surface. And this is the thermal foot footprint produced by these, um, these, these bubbles here. And this is a, an example of Khalil Stefiani's work where you have a droplet that's put on the top of a surface and it's evaporating and you're looking at it with, the, with an IR camera and you see these beautiful thermal capillary um, patterns um, on the flow as this thing evaporates. This is another example. This is a silicon heat sink with a branching structure here. So liquid is introduced in the middle and as the flow evaporates, it converts to a vapor, so you need more area to reduce the pressure drop. And um, these uh, people at Oregon State University are looking at the heat transfer distribution in this type of silicon heat exchanger. And the same group is looking at uh, boiling within droplets using an IR camera. So this is an overview of the technique. So we have a silicon wall. And the problem with the silicon is that it's very conductive. It's about 120 watt per meter Kelvin, which is high thermal conductivity. So if we had the silicon tube here and we had a bubble passing, the heat transfer is going to change. But because of the high thermal conductivity, it's going to even out all the temperature variations. And we're not going to see any change in temperature. So what we have to do is we have to put onto the silicon, and this is on the inside of the tube, we put a layer of polyimid. This is a capped on tape. It's this orange electrical tape that's transparent and is used to uh, insulate electronic components. We put a very thin layer of polyimid plus the adhesive, and this has a much lower thermal conductivity. So if the heat transfer here changes, and we have a very thin black paint that's on top of this, if the heat transfer coefficient here changes, it produces a much larger temperature variation across this uh, very thin insulator because of this low thermal conductivity. And we use this IR camera to back out what this temperature is. Unfortunately, we have a layered structure. So if we have, let's say, energy being emitted by this black paint, this energy, part of it's going to be absorbed in this polyimid. What's left is going to reach this interface. Part of it could be reflected back towards interface, and part of it will be transmitted. Part of that energy can be absorbed in the silicon. Again, it can be reflected again. And only a part of this energy is going to re reach the IR camera. Of this reflected energy, this reflected energy can go back, be re-reflected at this interface, and part of it can go back to the black paint, which is not completely black, so part of that is reflected again. The, ener the poly image itself is going to emit energy. And again, that's going to bounce around in here an infinite number of times. And so we have to take all the accounting, the proper accounting of this radiation within this multi-layer structure into account. Okay. And so if you do that, you come up with a bunch of equations which says that the energy received by the camera is a function of the energy reflected from the surroundings plus the effective emissivity of the silicon times the energy emitted by the silicon times the effective energy emitted by the tape um, and the energy emitted by this black surface which reaches this camera. Unfortunately, we have a temperature gradient in the polyimid. And the energy emitted by the polyimid, again, is a function of the temperature gradient. And we have absorption within this polyimid as well. So we have to know the temperature distribution in the polyimid in order to do this calculation that we can use to calculate the black surface temperature. We don't know that beforehand. So what we do is we have this iterative technique. We combine, we do a combined um, heat conduction equation calculation, okay, along with the radiant heat conduction calculation. We assume an initial temperature profile in the capped on tape, and we take a bunch of time steps, and then after a certain time, in this case is 0.1 seconds, the initial temperature has died out, and we're able to come up with the uh, actual temperature distribution within the capped on tape, and this data, this, this actually works quite well. Um, this is the uncertainties here. I won't go through that. Uh, it's all in the paper that we've written. So what we did was we did a validation of this technique. 
So we have this silicon wafer here, a flat silicon wafer with a heater on it. And the silicon wafer has a black coating on top with a polyimid tape. We have these gold mirrors so that with this IR camera, we can directly measure the temperature of the top surface with the IR camera. But we can also measure the energy emitted by the, this whole structure through the bottom. And so the energy that we measure from the top is given here. The energy we measure from the bottom is given here. And through this calculation procedure, we take this data, we correct it to obtain the top surface temperature data, and then we're able to validate it with a direct measurement. Okay. So what we've done was we, we, we did this, and then we took an air jet, and we cooled the temper this, this heater down, and then we turned the air jet off so the heater comes up, back up again in temperature. And if you... Um, so this blue symbol, blue line, is the bottom temperature that we measure. This red line is what we've corrected for. And this green line gives the uh, direct measurement from the top. And you can see that these two agree very, very well. So this entire procedure works quite well. In this case, we were cooling the um, top surface down with an air jet, so the temperature was dropping. And then when we turn off, it uh, recovers again. Okay. So we're able to get this top temperature measurement from the bottom view once we've done all the prop correct property measurements, et cetera. Whoops. Okay, so this is another example here. In this case, we've put a droplet of liquid on the silicon surface, and we're going to be measuring the heat transfer distribution produced by this uh, droplet as it evaporates. So this is an example of that. Um, let me go to the next one here. So this is the uh, top view of the droplet coming down and striking the surface. This is actually the bottom view, the IR, raw IR image. This is the temperature produced by this droplet as it evaporates. And we take this data and we convert it to the heat flux with our technique. And we can, you can see that we can measure with high spatial resolution and high temporal resolution what the heat transfer is. Okay. All right, so we have this silicon tube here with a Kapton tape on the inside. And we build this flow loop. And um, in this particular case, we have the Kapton tape with a black coating on one side. We have the Kapton tape with no black coating on the other side. And we have this mirror arrangement so that we can look through the Kapton tape at the flow. And we can make, make, make the temperature measurements from this side. So with, the, with using one IR camera, we can do both the flow visualization as well as measure the local heat flux. Okay. So we have an experiment now. We have a technique which we, with which we can use to measure local heat transfers within tubes and hopefully validate mechanisms. What we now need is a way to produce microgravity. So how do you do that? Well, there are numerous ways of doing it. And as you go down this list, it becomes more expensive and more complicated. First one is drop towers, okay? Then it's aircraft, then it's a sounding rocket, then the space shuttle, and ultimately the space station. Let me talk just about, uh, just, uh, 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 about, about these two here. So this is a drop tower. This is not a drop tower. This is a Tokyo tower. But the height that you have to drop a package from, if you want a certain time t, is 1 half gt squared. So if you wanted one second of microgravity time, you could drop it from about a 1.5 story high building, which is maybe about this high here. Right? If you want two seconds, you have to multiply this by a factor of four. So you need six stories. If you want 10 seconds, you need 490 meters high. And the new Tokyo Tower here is 634 meters high, and plus they will not let you drop anything off of it. And um, you also have air resistance to consider at this height here. So um, it's not easy to, to get long microgravity times okay, in a drop tower. But the quality of microgravity is very high. So this is a 2.2 second drop tower at NASA, Glenn Research Center in Cleveland. This is a river down here, and this is a cliff, and they built this tower here. So um, you have your test package up here. It's held up by piano wire, and when you're ready to run, you clip the piano wire. The test package drops, and it hits an uh, airbag at the bottom, and it slows it down. And then, you, then the graduate student then pulls it back up again, and you're able to repeat this about 10 times per day. 
This is a uh, 5.1 second drop tower at NASA. So we need a much deeper hole now. And this was a hole built on the NASA base by a mining company. And in this case here, this is the test package that was up here. It's falling and it falls into this big tub of styrofoam pellets, okay, which slows the package down. But for this 5.1 second drop tower to get high quality microgravity, before it drops, they close this hole off and they have these big vacuum pumps which pump all the air out. And that's a very expensive, time consuming process. So in this case, only two drops per day can be made. Okay. This is the longest uh, drop tower currently in existence. There was a 10 second drop tower in Hokkaido. But they closed that down because too, it was too expensive to operate. But in this case here, it's a uh, 4.1 second drop tower. Um, it drops about 110 meters. This is in Bremen, Germany. What's unique about this is that you can double this time because there's a catapult at the bottom that launches your test package upward. Okay, so you're going up and you're decelerating at 9.81 meters per second. You reach the top and then it falls back down again. And the whole time it's, decel it's accelerating at minus 9.81 meters per second. So you can get about nine seconds and this is a very nice facility to work with. It's still not long enough for us though. Another way of doing it is to produce, uh, is to use a low gravity aircraft. NASA's aircraft is called the Vomit Comet. It's very appropriately named because about 50% of the people that fly on this, they get sick the first time they fly. They get used to it after some time, but they, they do get sick. So in this case here, the airplane is flying at about 6,100 meters. And then it, you experience a 1.8 G pull up. So this is, uh, you know, you're going down like this. And then over the top here, you're going to peak at about 8,500 meters. And you have about 20 to 25 seconds of low gravity time. It's about 0.01 G. It's not very high quality, but it's you know, not, not so bad either. So the gravity is 1.8 G in this period here. It goes down to 0 G. And then during the pull out, you go back up to 1.8 G. And the plane does this 40 times in a row. And if you get sick on number two, which my student has gotten sick on number two, they don't stop for you. Okay, and you still get sick. All right, and it's a terrible experience if you get sick. It's a wonderful experience if you don't get sick. So this is a uh, movie that we took way back in 1998, our pool boarding experiment, when we flew on the vomit comet. And um, our experiment is way up front here. These people have finished their work. They're having a good time floating around. Um, the cabin crew has since gotten rid of these wires. Uh, they got the wireless communications. So now there's no chance of wires getting around people's necks and killing them. This is our um, test facility. Our microheater, oh, this is our, this is, this is shows you what boiling looks like, pool boiling looks like in earth gravity and microgravity. This is me with a bag about to get sick. My student is amused that I'm about to get sick and he's not. And this is me floating and throwing up at the same time. Um, in microgravity, it's a big mess because it just sort of floats around. It gets all over your face. And uh, the test group comes around with these big white wipes to wipe your face off with. But this is pool boiling in microgravity. So this is a heated surface here. And boiling occurs. And uh, this, is, this is during the pull-up period. But then when the gravity goes away, there's no reason for the bubbles to leave anymore. So they hang around the surface, they coalesce, and they form this big, large bubble. And that causes dry out on the surface. So the heat transfer goes way down, okay? And um, you can see that the gravity level is not quite zero. These bubbles are very good accelerometers. But then as the uh, gravity level comes back, 1.8 G, you know, the bubbles get pulled off again and you get what you normally expect to see in, during boiling. Right, so this is pool boiling. We're doing flow boiling. Um, so we built a test apparatus that contains this uh, silicon tube, this heated silicon tube and this flow loop. And uh, these are two of my PhD students that are actually flying this week again on the NASA aircraft. And uh, this is an example of flow visualization. So this is flow boiling within the silicon tube, but this is in 1G. 
And this is where the fluid hexane. And so the fluid is coming up from the bottom, okay? And it's moving upward. And you can see uh, a bubble forming here, okay? And you get these, uh, you get what's called churn flow. In this case here, you have vapor going up, the liquid coming down, and because of the gravity, and they're fighting against each other, so the, so the flow is quite chaotic. But you can see that, you can see right through the silicon tube, you can see the flow regime. You can measure temperature variations within the fluid itself okay, from this. Um, so this is, uh, quite, this, is, this is you know, quite promising as a uh, heat transfer technique as well as a flow visual, visualization technique. So again, you can see as this bubble moves that in the wake of the bubble, you see these, um, you see these uh, temperature variations within the liquid. So this is an example. This is a uh, so flight that we made last year. This is microgravity. So the fluid is actually coming in this way and flowing out here. The tube is heated. And so we are able to measure the local heat transfer variation along this tube as this fluid evaporates. So what we've plotted here is the heat transfer coefficient as a function of distance along the tube here. And this is the uh, wall temperature on the outside and on the inside. This is the local heat flux that we measure using this technique that I just described. So from this measurement, we can come up with this, with this um, uh, heat transfer coefficient here. And if I play this for you, whoops, this is fine. Okay. So this is how the heat transfer coefficient is changing along a line at the center of this tube okay, with time. So this is the distribution of heat transfer coefficient versus time. And we can do this with many lines, of course, and get an area. But we believe this is the very first technique. This is the very first measurement of the local heat transfer within a tube during flow boiling. So everything else has been time average heat transfer and area average heat transfer. This gives you local time resolved heat transfer measurements. Okay, so you can see that it's dry out here. The heat transfer coefficient is zero. The fluid comes, re wets the surface, and you get this spike in your heat transfer. We can study quenching effects using this technique. We can study um, ma many different effects. So what we have found to date, this is all very preliminary data. If you're at a high flow rate, 500 milliliters per minute, this is the solid symbol, the blue and the red, there is no variation in the heat transfer coefficient with distance along the tube. However, if you go to a lower flow rate, around 100 milliliters per minute, you do see that in low gravity, which is the blue symbols, you get a lower heat transfer than in the, um, in the high gravity period. And this is a six millimeter inner diameter tube, the same diameter as the uh, tube that I passed around. Um, you can see that as the flow rate, at higher flow rate, you don't see anything, but at lower flow rate, you start to see a variation. So currently we're exploring this area in much more detail this week. And we're also looking at different tube sizes, four millimeters as well. Um, we can also use this technique to measure liquid film thickness, okay? So if this is your silicon tube here, right? This is your silicon tube here. And you have a liquid film here, all right? And you have a high temperature source here, your high temperature, you're looking at something that's hot. We can, from, we can, the energy uh, re, uh, that's uh, the camera detects is a function of all these things here. It's a very complicated equation, but it's a function of this delta only. Okay, so we can make measurements with and without liquid flowing, and uh, we can determine what this delta is. So we can use this technique to measure local film thickness along the wall as the uh, bubbles pass and um, during annular flow, et cetera. All right. uh, so anyways, um, details of this technique have been published. It was published late last year. It's available in the International Journal of Multiphase Flow. Uh, we're, we're previewing the data, in this case, with a four millimeter ID silicon tube this week. My students flew last night in Tokyo time. Um, we're also um, analyzing this heat transfer data to make, to, you know, to look at heat transfer mechanisms. And we're also looking at the feasibility of IR to obtain film thickness measurements. One other project that we recently started this, this, uh, this year, just a few, few months back, is 
you see these plate heat exchangers everywhere. They're used in refrigeration units. They're used, used on ships. They're used, you know, process plants, etc. This plate heat exchanger is, is it com consists of these herringbone patterns, right? These and these plates are, you know, bolted together or they're welded together, and the flow within these is very very complica complicated. But what we would like to do is to look at the flow process within this heat exchanger of which very little data is available and certainly not any local data. So we're in the process of making two plates out of silicon, one with this herring bone pattern, and we're going to put two those plates together. We can heat the outside and we can use an IR camera to look through and we can do flow visualization and we can make uh, heat, local heat transfer measurements within this very complicated herring bone structure for both single phase as well as boiling. Um, evaporative um, conditions. So uh, with that, it's Friday afternoon. We should go eat nice food and have some sake. Um, I would like to uh, end my talk and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have.